What about this? We have the BDO referee and caller, Mr. Hugh Ware. How are you doing, Hugh? Yeah, I'm all right, Paul. Thanks. How are you? I'm very well. Have you recovered from the Winmore World Masters? Just about. <laughs> <laughs> we're, two, we're two days on from it, and yeah. uh, normally on the Monday, uh, the trip home yesterday was a nightmare, so yeah. recovered, and I'm okay now. Yeah. Well, where are you based, Hugh, if you don't mind? I'm in Cardiff. You're in Cardiff. Ah, not not far from, from Wimwood themselves, then? No, no, not at all. We, we got caught in the M1 traffic yesterday, which was a nightmare. Yeah. Did about 10 miles in four hours, so uh, that was not how uh, I thought I deserved. No. <laughs> that was not my reward for the, for the World Masters. No, no, definitely not. I mean, that's a, a, a massive event, isn't it? You know, with qualifiers everywhere, and of course, building up to it, of course, World Championship qualifiers and Grand Slam qualifiers. Um, I quickly mentioned that, of course, we, I mentioned it to Richard just a moment ago, but Larry Butler and, and Eric, uh, Eric? <laughs> Eric the Viking, even, not Eric. <laughs> and he's going to love you for that one. Andy the Viking Fordham. What, what, what a great story that is. Yeah, it's brilliant. And Larry Butler is probably going to be one of the most iconic names in darts ever. Yeah. Uh, simply for winning the 1994 World Match Play, the mm. first winner. And then for him to come here 21 years later. I mean, we've seen him since 1994, over this last decade or so. He's popped up once or twice in different World Championships, World Cup of Darts. But for him to reach the final of another major tournament, yeah. uh, and to be involved in that Martin Adams semi-final, which was just a great game. Yeah. Um, it's superb, and then you've also got Andy Fordham, you know, but it just shows that, is there such a thing as a darts player career ending? No, yeah, it, it, that's right. It, so many resurgences in darts over recent years, Butler, Fordham, yeah. uh, you know, amongst others, so... Yeah. You know, is there such a thing? I'm not sure now. No, well, that is, that is, it is it is a great tournament. And having stories like that, of course, like Larry making the semi-final and that we said, the Grand Slammer darts qualifier. I mean, it's just great stories that people never give up, really. Never give up. Never give up. I mean, I think Larry's situation was probably different to Andy's. Larry's always played darts in North America and things, but... Um, you know, I just, I just think we all thought that Larry Butler 1994 World Match Play, yeah, uh, that, and, you know, that will be what he's remembered for. But it just goes to show if you keep persevering and you never lose it. No. Form is temporary, class is permanent. Yeah. We mentioned Richard, of course, a couple of games that stand out because it's semi final against Wolfie. But the, I, I, I wouldn't go too much in it because you've already done it. But the, the, the ladies' final, uh, you know, what a fantastic advert that was for ladies' diets. You know, the, the 1 3 2 8, you know, following a 1 7 1 and a 1 80 and the, the balls I checked from Aileen. I mean, it was just a great advert all round for the standard of, uh, of women's diets, really. Yeah, absolutely. I think that game sums up just how far the women's game has progressed in the last four or five years. Yeah. Um, both Lisa and Aileen, they had that great game at the World Championship in the first round a couple of years ago, um, which was quickly said to be the best ladies' game of darts ever. Um, but I think their World Masters final could well better it, because I mean, you, as you say, you had those sequence of nine darts, the 171 ball, ball, double 16, and then the 180. But then to see Aileen hit the 76 yeah. uh, on the bullseye as well to win the eighth leg. I mean, it was just an extraordinary topsy-turvy game. Yeah. It was fast. It was exciting. Um, yeah, as you say, a great advert for the ladies' game and yeah. uh, a brilliant way to round off the World Masters for the ladies. Very much so. Now, um, y y yourself, you, if you don't mind me asking, how, how did it start? I mean, I do a little bit of calling, not like uh, professional events, but exhibitions, a bit of MC work. And in fact, mentioning MCs, I was just speaking to Richard Ashdown, and he, he did, off camera, he did say, um, what, what has, ask you's opinion, how good is Richard Ashdown? <laughs> how good is Richard? <laughs> that was his question. <laughs> On the mic? Yeah. He, he's, he's mediocre. He's mediocre. That's good. So there you go, Richard. Uh, there are things he could improve. You know, there are certain aspects you know, <laughs> which he needs to work on. <laughs> He, he is he is great a great ambassador as I think I said earlier on um, for, for for darts in general it doesn't matter you know whether it was BDO or, or PDC but yourself so when did it start when did you realise that you know calling uh, refereeing is something you wanted to get into um, I think because I was ref I started refereeing while I was playing I mean I was playing for Glamorgan County Youth yeah and um, we had a friendly match against the seniors and the caller didn't turn up. Yeah. So I went on stage, did a few games, and stayed on for most of the day, actually. Yeah. Um, 
and then some of the senior squads at the end of the day said that sounded really good. Um, do you fancy coming to call for Glamorgan County? So I said yes. Um, did that for about two or three years. Fast forward through that time and I was asked to do the World Masters back in 2011. Yeah. Um, and when I got there, Martin Fitzmaurice said, we'll give you the two youth finals on stage and then maybe if, you, if you're good, we'll give you one or two of the men's. Yeah. And I ended up st staying on until the semi-finals. I did the second semi-final that year. Um, and then on to Lakeside, I've just been, a, I suppose, a permanent fixture yeah. Ever since, yeah. really. And, and any embarrassing stories you want to tell us? Any, any major bloopers? <laughs> how, how long have you got? Oh, is it like that? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> well, there was one this weekend where Larry Butler. Oh yeah. Uh, completely threw me on one five two. He hit the twenty, then a treble nineteen. Yeah. So seventy seven scored, but seventy five left. I thought, okay, hey, up, uh, you know, concentrate now. But I was looking at the seventeens. Yeah. Um, thinking right, treble 17, 128, single 17, 94, yeah. and he hit treble 13, yeah. and I was gone for a second, I thought, well, hang on, that leaves 36, so what did I call 126? Ah, that's it. it. What I... not 16. And as soon as I said 26, I knew I got it wrong, and I thought, you absolute pillar. Yeah, because it, it, what, what I generally find is that if, if I'm calling, if, if they... the Trebles go all over the board, like you know, like some of these youngsters, you know, or any of the players do now. You know what they've got left, so just quickly take away what they got left and what they had, and so that gets me out of jail a little bit, I think. Uh, it, I think that's the classic thing: is that if, if you're thrown, it's because you're thinking of a certain route, and then they go another, yeah. and it just it just goes for yeah. a, a millisecond, and you have to recalculate. Yeah. Or, or the, the other nice one is to have a quick look and is if you can't quite make out whether one of them's in, and that buys you that extra split second, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah <laughs> Yeah, but uh, no. I mean, there was one time at Lakeside, I thought Robbie Green, I thought it was a certain 180, and I actually very nearly started to call it, but all the audience went, oh, yeah, so no. thought, oh he's missed, is he? And, yeah. uh, I had a quick look over, and it was a 140. Do you get nervous at all, Hugh, as, as you're going on the stage? Yeah, I do get nervous, um, but I think it's controlled nerves. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think you, you do just get up and do the job, and... You know, I think, because I've been on all the stages now, I think it has gotten a bit easier, yeah. and I know all the players and whatever else. I remember when I first started, I was really nervous, but um, it's not so that it blocks your quality in doing the job. Yeah. No, I mean, any, any players you sort of uh, watch out for? You know, like like maybe like a, say like a BDO, a former BDO champ like Yellow Class, and I mean, you've got to be on your game if you're calling one of his, <laughs> haven't you? Yeah. Because, I mean, he is bang, 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 and, you know, it, it's the Dutch players, generally. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think the young, fast players, um, I did the boys' final this weekend with Justin Van Sachau, and uh, Joshua Richardson, and they're both young and fast and can count very well yeah. and I found that in some ways harder to do a best of seven bang 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 game than, yeah. uh, than someone like Larry Butler against Madar Jasmine for example yeah um, and yeah I think it is those the ones who are fast and who spray them around the board yeah they are the toughest mm. but um, it's okay you know it, but normally you can handle it normally yeah. That, that's why I think I'll stick to the exhibition works. If you make a mistake, that gets a laugh from the crowd. You can't do, you can't do that if you're live on BBC or Eurosport. It doesn't look quite quite the part. Oh, but it still makes the audience laugh. Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does. So then all roads, of course, lead to Frimley Green then, Hugh. That's the big one, of course, at the start of next year. Um, it, 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 the whole calendar, because it's massive, but that's the one that everyone looks forward to. Mm, absolutely, and it's... Um it does bring its own certain set of pressures. I mean, even when I ref, it, it doesn't feel like a natural environment for refereeing. No. Um, it's, it's the hardest gig of the year for refereeing, so God knows what it's like for the players. Yeah. Um, to play their natural darts up there is very, very tough. But I think at the moment, I think this year, in terms of the standard, it's been really, really good on the circuit this year. Yeah. I really enjoyed particularly the latter stages of the 2015 Lakeside and the 20. 14 i thought there was a really good standard there yeah. so hopefully that can continue this tournament and looking at the draw there's some good there's some good ties in there yeah yeah and of course you've now got ted hankey confirmed he's back the count is back looking for title number three yeah i think he was the second happiest player in hull after glenn Dunham won you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. glenn Dunham the first and ted the yeah. second because of course if butler had won then that would have meant jimmy Wood went to lakeside yeah, true. but um yeah it's been uh it's going to be really good to see him there. Yeah. Um, I think the crowd are going to really look forward to seeing him. 
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be all right. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I'll tell you what, Hugh, thank you so much for joining us on Behind the Bar. And if you don't mind, we're, we'll be in contact again, um, perhaps near the World Championship, and have a, a few more of your thoughts, if that's OK. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'd love to. Love yeah. to, Paul. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, Hugh, and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you. Try now. Cheers, mate. Bye. Fantastic. A little bit of inside information there. Of course, how it is to be a BDO referee. And don't forget, look at our BDO YouTube channel, classic dance matches from years gone by. And of course, up to date. And don't forget to join us next week on more Behind the Bar with Paul Starr.